<laughs> Hello, Carol Taylor Carney here at Palin Arts, and I'm with Florence Weiss, and we are standing in front of a diptych, an intriguing diptych that Florence is going to tell us about. Florence? Well, uh, these are part of my series called Sensuous Stripes, and uh, the sensuous uh, organic part comes from the fact that I photograph people wearing striped clothing. And I get as close up as they will let me and uh, <laughs> just love the stripes and the possibilities of, of uh, combining them uh, in various uh, permutations. Well, I realized that in your last uh, piece that you had in the show here and you were letting me go through your wonderful binder, um, these stripes can occur in so many different places. Uh, they are clothing, they might show up in your environment, they might even show up on a fish. And so, you know, your, your imagination like re really wants, runs wild and you're even wearing stripes, which makes it even It's better. her signature pattern. <laughs> there you go. So when you, you're doing this and you have the different pieces um, it, I, I mean, some of it I can, I can pinpoint and say, wow, well, that looks like maybe that's two, pe yeah, a piece of clothing that goes like this, and, or something else might look like a billow. But then these other ones, I can see this is cut paper. So, so the stripe is made from negative versus positive space. Yeah, so mm -hmm. how, did, it, how does it come to you within the process of how one thing fits together, or how you're going to make marks to bridge these things? Mm -hmm. Well, I never know what's going to happen. It's kind of an intuitive process. I print out the, the, uh, the striped photographs on, um, on my HP printer, eight and a half by 11. That's as large as I can get. <laughs> so the trick is how do I make a larger piece from eight and a half by 11 mm -hmm. uh, photos. And I think these white stripes was the, just the edge of the paper mm -hmm. uh, that remained white. And I thought, okay, I can, I can use it. And I, I, they're, they're attached. And then I, um, I cut it with a, a, an X-Acto knife and it, it worked. So well, that was, a, a just spontaneous discovery. One of the yeah. things that I think is interesting about stripes generally and like more in depth in your work is that when we think of stripes, we think of regimented equidistance strips of color. And one of the things that you're playing with both in terms of flat in the photo is the idea that our brains process stripes as being these regimented equidistance things, but when they're on you, they curve and create a form. Mm -hmm. So you have both taken a picture that shows the curving of the stripes, and then you have actually added curving and movement of that as well, and you bring other stripes across, uh, which is such a difficult thing to play with. Can you tell us a bit about how you approach using stripes in that, that kind of way? Um, well, I really don't know how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a process of discovery, and I move move things around and and uh, just get get excited about the, the the different forms that they take. Uh, I I like this is color photography, so uh, I have this this tan area, which is actually the shadow. Mm -hmm. If mm. if you look at somebody wearing wearing stripes, uh, some of the body will be in shadow. And, yeah. and, and that's a lovely effect for me. I don't, don't want to lose that. Well, the concentration, like as they become concentrated in certain areas, it's nice because it gives you the shape of the body that it was on and like paints that for you. And these are all on canvas, on flat boards or canvases. So we have all this, you know, Billowing yeah, there's an undulation on. going yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, 
so that the the photograph itself looks three dimensional because of the the shadows and the fact that it's photographed on a, a three dimensional form. But then I add it, add to it by by. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah. Well, curling. I mean, it's basically it, by cur yeah, curling it in. Then this was the first one I I did, and I realized that I left a seam. I didn't even notice the seam until you were talking about the size of the paper. And then I realized I can tuck the seam in, so that there's no way of knowing that this is from a source that's only eight and a half by eleven. A, uh, and your matching's impeccable. Well, and whether it was on yeah. the piece that you had in the show before. Or the piece now, people were so surprised when I would point out to them, do you see the edge of this? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, oh. Uh -huh. And that's that's the other point, point I was going to bring up in, in all this wonderful surprises. You have to come in and see these in real life because you, you don't get the wonderful surprises unless you're right there with them. Be, for example, this perfectly matches this. But if you're standing here where I am, you're looking into that curve, it's black on the back. And so you have all these cute little surprises that pop up here. This, I'm well, like, the, is and the black, silver? the black, I'm just stepping to the front. The black reflects perfectly in line with this line, which is, so this actually swirls and meets this, which is, sorry, don't tilt. And I also think it's interesting that this paper is all the same, but because of the way you've captured the light, this almost looks shimmery when I'm standing from a distance. Yeah. You, you get so many different effects. Yeah, and it's all surprises to me. I, I do not know what to expect. And then I found that I could continue the line. This is um, book cloth mm. that they use for buying yeah. books. And I paint the back. It becomes black on with a white background and I paint the black so that when you see it from other sides it, uh, yeah these you can stuff. be viewed from a multitude of angles and because there are optical illusions to like you're photographing it's not that the photograph's an optical illusion because it's just the camera recording the data that our eyes do too but then the way you play with them also creates an optical illusion that it both tricks and surprises your eye because of the way that the components are coming together. I'm surprised Bridget Riley, the famous you know stripe artist, it didn't come, didn't figure this stuff out. You know, didn't yeah. do work. You've got something on her there, Florence. <laughs> so, which is which is wonderful. And and you also have to come in and take a look at like some of these little curves that occur up here, and that this is literally almost a comb to you know tooth comb that goes ar around there. yeah and but when that's one of the things that's interesting too is that when you're looking at it from far away or when you're looking at it through a video you the stripes integrate and so you can't like the standalone like cut out stripes because they're over top of another thing yeah. it it's easy to give like for your brain to have to process through like what's coming forward, what's receding, what is a flat pattern. It's mm -hmm. it's terribly interesting. Yeah. And, and then the fact that I crop it so that you can't see the body and you can't see the arm, yes. uh, it, it just iso isolates it from uh, other connotations and you see it as pure abstract. Yeah, in some ways it reminds me of, um, there's an, another artist who was in this previous show that you were also in, uh, where he was saying he likes to take pictures of things that everybody observes every day. And you have talked about this, and definitely when we were going through your binder, we were talking about this. It's something that you're noticing in everyday life. And when you're moving through life, you might say, oh, I like that pattern. Oh, I like that. So oh, I like that. But you are focusing in in a way that allows us to see the nuance and view it as a whole and takes it, uh, separates it kind of from the mundane into this other thing into art so well one of the qu other questions i have for you is um uh, what would you like the viewer to come away with or um what is a way that you see a viewer should be moving through you are engaging with it yeah oh that's up to the viewer <laughs> i i present it and then uh 
every, everyone responds differently for different reasons, and that's that's the wonderful part of the abstract art. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about conversation in like with a lot of artists uh, feel similarly abstract artists, especially that it's a conversation and they want the viewer to engage with it and then either formulate their own narrative or be in almost collaboration and conversation with the piece, which I think is beautiful because what's better than getting to know each other, even if that other is art. And for the audience who, who are coming in and falling in love with this, um, where would you suggest is the perfect audience for where they're going to go put this? Like where, if you if you acquire it, where where would they put this in their home, in their office? Oh, it could it could be any anywhere. Yeah, just a maybe a striped throw pillow <laughs> <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> well, definitely these are paper, and I was going to ask you about the paper, but definitely not a bathroom or kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to sell it from there. Terrible, terrible decision for yeah. that, yes. Right. So, But these are so strong and speak to each other with such strength that they really are a piece that if you, they should be a focal point. Like sometimes you can do gallery walls and things like that where you have a mix of pieces. These are in such conversation with each other that if you have a place where you can stop and rest and that's well anchored, like, I, we were talking about this earlier too. I like to anchor things with a table that allows you to get just close enough so that you can really engage. Yeah. And then when you back up, it speaks to you in different ways. So, uh, but that can happen in a multitude of places, both domestic and professional. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And of course, we always say the ideal place is in a museum, but luckily you can make your home a museum. So. You, you should make your home a museum, at least a museum for you. The curated life. So, I, and I know that these have been shown in other places. Could you indicate to uh, the people who are watching, you know, some of the other places that, um, so they get ideas of where they would see something like this? Wow. Okay. Off the top of my head, I'd have to look at my, my resume. What's a, what a question. No, well, see, I, I saw... Look, you have to go. I saw the piece. I think you're thinking of the same piece where you were building a striped installation in the foyer of a building uh, that had like long black stripes that took up the like you were extending out onto the walls. Is that what you were thinking of too? Yeah. Yeah. All right. These were uh, shown actually in in uh, Swarthmore Borough Hall. Yeah. Uh, last last November. Uh, and uh, I think they were shown separately. It's not necessarily a diptych. They work uh, in individually. Each one is on, so on strong. Yeah, I agree. That, yeah, I agree. I agree. But they look beautiful together. They look beautiful together, but yeah, each one, it, both of the, they're both showstoppers. Yeah. So. So come see these showstoppers. June. At, okay, at Palain Arts from June 2nd till August 7th. Nailed it. And if you're lucky, you might get to meet Florence. <laughs> Thank you.